successfully colonizes the state, state administration, crucially, I think, the administration of justice. And it constructs these close networks of business interests uh, so that whatever political power the opposition may have, it becomes irrelevant. We know this from various situations in history where you have a politician who says, no, I think what should happen is the following. And the state administration, the state machinery, simply doesn't do what he or she tells them to do. That was certainly the case in 45, 48 in both Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Um, there are other cases that one can look at. Uh, I believe that uh, this is a particular way of running a state. It's viable. I think it's capable, at least for a period of time, of self-reproduction. Um, a sizable section of the electorate, I think we should not overlook this, is given enough to secure a reasonably solid voter base, uh, and, the election, and the electorate can bring about change only if the system is very badly run, if for whatever reason it collapses. This, this I think, was the case in Hungary in 2010. Um, I would say that democracy is not the default condition of the world. A system of this kind is attractive to quite a number of people, majority, minority, but certainly we can see that it is attractive to some of the people in the Eastern Partnership states. And I think the West, with its preference for stability, will frequently overlook the flaws in what purports to be a democracy, uh, which I think is actually a kind of semi authoritarianism, but as I say, the criteria of democracy uh, are constantly. I think to the European Union, the West generally remains inexperienced uh, where former communist countries are concerned. And what I have found in the last nine and a half years in Brussels is that it's very uninterested in the accumulated knowledge of the 2004-2007 enlargement states. They don't want to know what we know. They don't listen. Countless examples. Two million also said it's countless examples. I think they have to add here that energy. Uh, binds the European Union, especially Germany, but not just Germany, into a dependent relationship with Russia. Russians talk about the energy weapon. We, on the other hand, don't talk about the energy weapon. We think there is a, a, a market in energy. I was at a conference some years ago, last three, I think, in Riga, where Commissioner Oettinger said that Latvia pays 25% more for its gas than does Germany. Is that a market? If so, it's somewhat distorted. Um, I would add here that the current crisis in the European Union makes the whole of further enlargement difficult to legitimate. Um, the EU, I think, is generally hesitant about the Eastern Partnership states. For example, there's no equivalent of, so, of the Thessaloniki summit, the declaration of 2003, that these countries can or do have a European dimension. Um, I do follow. Southeastern Europe very closely under the shadow of Serbia. So I, I watch that very closely. And I think that the, the level of commitment to the eastern region is much lower now than it is toward the southern region. The southern neighborhood, I think, has much higher priority in the thinking of the great majority, probably politically, perhaps two thirds of the present members of the European Union. Um, Arab Spring, now the deal with Iran give you a global context of what's happened in the Eastern Partnership State. I think from the, nobody's going to say this out loud, but it would not surprise me. Some people quietly were not quite pleased really that Ukraine has pulled back. Because it, it solves all sorts of problems. We don't have to deal with these countries to the east of us and so on. Um, finally, what I see is a uh, forthcoming theory. Well, I think that the present amb ambiguity and intermediacy will Persist, uh, will persist. There is a contest for power between the European Union and Russia. This will continue. I think the Eastern Partnership states will exploit this uh, to their advantage where they can. Uh, so the fuller idea of more for more is not going to work very well. I don't think the Eastern Partnership countries want to be completely subordinated to Moscow. To that extent, they will use the European Union. But I don't think they really want what the European Union is offering them. Perhaps one other thought, if I may, to add another minute and a half of your time, Mr. Yushkin's question. The war between civilizations. 
what's the Western attitude to this? It seems to me you know, the West is in denial about this. I mean, remember the reception of Huntington. Basically, it was dismissed as uh, wrong-headed, fundamentally. Um, there is a very strong current of Western universalism, a belief in progress. I use that word with considerable hesitation. I don't think there is such a thing. Um, there's a belief of a Western, especially an American, mission. A mission to change the world. Consequently, oh, because it's all to do with the doctrine of the, the elect of God, a certain strand of Protestantism. Um, hence, uh, as a measure of tacit, perhaps contempt is too strong, disdain for all other cultures, all other civilizations, because the belief that in the fullness of time, all these other cultures will disappear and we'll all be like the United States, and we'll all have to go to McDonald's and eat hamburgers, I myself absolutely refuse to do that. Thank you. <laughs>